Let's rise up for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this year's Easter retreat and for the uniqueness that has characterized it all together. We appreciate you for the way you've been ministering to us since we started yesterday. And we thank you for what you have in mind to even speak to us now. We join our voices with the voices of the Corinthians. We're asking and praying that you make us true disciples of Christ in deed and in truth in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to live for you and to serve you as you deserve to be served in Jesus' name. And grant to us, Lord, that obedience of a disciple that, Lord, we will fulfill your joy for our calling in Jesus' name. As we go into the ministry of the word now, speak to our hearts. Grant us understanding. And help us to put your words to practice, both in our lifestyle and our conduct and ministry and service for you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. Speak to us now, Lord, for we your children are hearing. For we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. We can please be seated. In the program before us, we are under the theme of Believers Ministry. Believers Ministry. Believers in Christ. Those who have believed to the saving of their souls by the efficacious sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the topic of our message is the daily ministry of true disciples. That topic has a direct implication when it says true disciples. That implies there are false disciples. There are fake disciples. There are counterfeit disciples. Little wonder Jesus says on the last day, people will come to him and will say, Lord, we have uh, ministered in your name. We have uh, preached in your names. We have uh, performed miracles in your names. We have cast out demons in your name. And we have done many wonderful works in thy name. And Jesus says, he will tell them point blank, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye workers of iniquity. I pray that will not be our portion in eternity in Jesus' name. So then, we're talking about the daily ministry of true disciples. Disciples of Christ in deed and in verity. And now, we are looking at ministries committed to such individuals. And he says, this ministry is not just once in a year ministry. It's not one that we approach or carry out once in a month. It's not something we do occasionally. It's something that is done on daily basis, so long as life permits. We're looking at such ministry that is for everybody called by Christ. I take my text in Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 16. Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 16. I read from verse 15 to 20. And he said, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, 
and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth through disciples now. And they went forth the obedience of genuine disciples. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And the old church I echo, Amen. So we see from here, the ministry that we are talking about, it is the ministry of evangelism. The ministry of soul winning. The ministry of preaching to the saving of souls. That is every believer's ministry. Every genuine Christian's ministry. In 2 Corinthians, we want to see how this ministry was carried out by genuine disciple of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading there in verse 18 through 20. And all things are of God, who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Here is Apostle Paul now. He said, God has reconciled us unto himself through a go-between, through an intermediary, through a, a, a sin bearer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he didn't only reconcile us to himself, after reconciling us to himself, he has also given unto us a ministry. And that ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. That is telling you something. That a sinner is at variance with God. A sinner is on a war path with God. A sinner is an enemy of God. And being an enemy of God, he cannot serve the Lord. God cannot commit his service unto him. Before he can be engaged in the ministry of the Lord, such a sinner needs to take the first step of reconciliation with God. He must reconcile with God. He must bow unto God through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment he reconciles, the moment he settles his differences with God, the moment he submits his allegiance to God, immediately, almost automatically, such a reconciled disciple receives a ministry of reconciling other erring children of God unto him. Look at it again in verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's the starting point. How many people go about preaching the gospel? How many people get involved in Christian ministry? How many people go about in the name of Jesus serving the Lord and yet they are at a war part with God? And yet they don't know God? And yet God is angry with it because the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. When he says the wicked, it's not just talking about uh, those who carry arms. It's not talking about those who shed blood. It's talking about the sinner. And a single sin in your life makes you an enemy of God. And so then, the starting point is the reconciliation with Christ. And after that reconciliation, it goes on and says, And are given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation you can see it there repeating it over and over again reconciling us to himself giving us the ministry of reconciliation how giving us a word of reconciliation repetition they say calls for emphasis there's need for reconciliation first before you can be involved in the ministry 
of reconciling other people unto God. Verse 20. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Paul, the apostle, having reconciled to God on the way to Damascus, because he said he was an injurious person, a blasphemous, and I'm a blasphemer, and a persecutor of the church. And he said he wasted the church of God. But then, on one glorious day, he was going on, uh, you know, this uh, wicked mission on the way to Damascus. And then a voice came to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. People who persecute Christians. They are not just persecuting Christians, they are persecuting Christ. Those who oppose, who resist, who hinder the ministry of the word of God, the preaching of the gospel, the church of Christ. They are not just persecuting, you know, human beings. They are persecuting Christ himself. And then, thank God, immediately he settled his uh, account, you know, with God. He became reconciled unto God. And then immediately he says, he's now an ambassador for Christ. What is true of Saul of Tarsus? It's true of everybody who genuinely repents and is saved. And so, after they will become an ambassador of Christ, our ministry is to pers persuade people. He says, we beseech you by all. God beseech you by all. We pray you in Christ's stead. We are appealing to you. We are persuading you. Be ye reconciled to God. What is that? That is evangelism in action. Evangelism is every believer's ministry, as we have said. We cannot all be apostles. That is not possible. We cannot all be miracle workers like Apostle Paul, like Peter, like Philip, and a host of other miracle workers in the Bible. No, not all of us can do the work of a prophet. Now bring great and supernatural faith down from the throne of God. But every believer is an indispensable instrument, a veritable tool in God's arm. God has an urgent assignment, a compelling task, and a commission that every believer that has confessed and forsaken his sins must necessarily be involved in. It is a task for all, not only for a few privileged people, in the church it is the responsibility and vocation of every believer every believer is indebted to the outside fold to the people in the outside fold hence the whole notion of evangelism the whole notion of evangelizing the people around us rests squarely on all believers who are born again the glorious privilege of proclaiming the gospel has been denied angels in heaven because this is an assignment that even angels, you know, covet, angels desire, angels are seeking privilege, opportunity. A God should allow them to go and preach the gospel. But no, God has denied them the privilege. It is unto us, saints. It's unto us, believers. It's unto us, born again Christian. That God has bestowed this great privilege. Don't, don't you remember what, uh, you know, the prayer of the rich man in hell? You know, Lazarus, you know, they have been with him here and now. But eventually, time with the two of them, you know, has to come to an end. Just like time with you and I, we also come to an end one day. We will not continue to live forever here. But then, Lazarus being a child of God, when he left here, the Bible says, angel carried him into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and he was buried. And then he opened his eyes in air and in hell, being torment, he started pleading and praying, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to come and dip his finger in water to come and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this place. But then Abraham reminded him and said, Son, remember, remember that thou in thy lifetime, you didn't have time for God. 
Remember all entreaties of the gospel. Every evangelistic approach to you, you, you know, was revolved. Remember, you didn't have time for God at that time. Remember this prayer you ought to have prayed when you had the opportunity. Remember, you attended the retreats. Remember, you, they were, you were invited to a crusade. Remember, you had all the you know preaching of the gospel. But everything fell into the into your deaf ear. Now, time with you is over. And it's unfortunate you have, you know, come into this place you have, you know, you have, you have chosen. Now, eventually, when he knew that it was impossible for him to change, he changed his fortune in eternity. He changed his request. He said, okay, Father Abraham, I have five brethren in the world that I know the way they are living, they will also end up in a gruesome end like I am now. Please send Lazarus to go to the world and preach to them. Hmm. Abraham said, they have prophets, they have evangelists, they have believers, they have children of God that are ministering to them. If they will not heed the warning, if they will not accede to the request, if they will not obey the gospel message from them, Sorry about it. Even if once you rise from the dead to go and preach to them, they will neither obey the gospel. So then, the point is, saints who have gone are not permitted. Angels in heaven are not permitted. The responsibility rests squarely on your shoulder, on my shoulder, as many of us as are born again. And so then, every believer is indebted to those that are outside the fold, the owners of evangelizing the people around us rest clearly on the believer's shoulder. The glorious privilege of proclaiming the gospel that has been denied angels or saints who are already, you know, uh, uh, resting in heaven is now our home. Therefore, we have to make it the central vocation and a binding duty of our daily life. I am praying that we will not disappoint the Lord in this glorious responsibility in Jesus' name. We are looking at three points in the message. Point number one, the command to true disciples. Understand, every time we keep on distinguishing because every genuine thing has its own counterfeits. Every genuine material has its own fake. So we are talking about genuine disciple, true disciple. Point number two, compelling reasons for believers' daily evangelism. And there are reasons. Not just ordinary reasons. Compelling reasons why you and I must daily engage in this holy vocation. We are going to see together when we get there. Point number three, commitment and crowning of faithful disciples. Yes. Every endeavor, meaningful endeavor, attracts its own reward. And definitely, God is not unfaithful to forget our labor of love when we commit ourselves to the work of evangelism and we do it faithfully. God will not hold any man. He's going to reward every one of us in due course. I am praying that on that crowning day, on that rewardable day, none of us will regret for having disappointed the Lord, for having neglected this duty in Jesus' name. Let's look at point number one. The command to true disciples. I go back to our text, Mark Gospel, chapter 16. Reading there in verse 16, verse 15. Mark, Gospel, chapter 16, reading verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here is the command to true disciples. Go ye. Don't, say that. Don't stay aloof. Go ye. Don't be negligent. Go ye 
Don't be like a dice guy about it. Go ye. And the word go is a word of action. It demands action from you and I. We are to go. We are not to sit down. We are to go to them. We are not to expect them to come to us. We are to go. And in going, we are not just to go and entertain them. We are not, you know, to just tickle their hairs. You find so-called gospel preachers today in the world, and all they do in their chapels, in their, you know, uh, synagogues and assemblies and churches is just entertainment. He just entertain the people. Dance, sing, and do all kinds of things except preaching sound gospel. They do all else. But preaching the word of God, they just give a small portion to the and the word they say they preach. When they say they come to preach, just evaluate the content of the message. You will know that everything is just to, you know, motivate and to, you know, tell them about things of this life, you know, all these prosperity preachers, how, you are, how God is going to prosper you, how that once you become a child of God, all things are yours and you can begin to enjoy life and you can, uh, you know, no more problem, no more, you know, failure, no more whatever. Once you are a child of God, you are on top of the world and the, all that prosperity preaching. Don't tell them the truth. Don't tell them to repent. Don't tell them that God is angry with their sin. And then they just say, you know, entertain them and sing and dance. Darling Jesus, darling Jesus. Oh my darling Jesus, you are around that. As if Jesus is their boyfriend. Motivational preachers. That's not what we are to do. Go ye. To all the world and preach the gospel. Don't entertain them. Don't preach prosperity. The, people, the reason why Jesus came to this world is not to make people rich. Of course, God, you know, has the power. He, you know, he blesses people. But that's not the primary reason. That's not the primary purpose. Why Jesus came. And Apostle Paul said, if only in this world, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men completely for me. Most miserable. If only in this world. Gain dollar. Gain naira. Gain prosperity. Gain uh, you know houses. Gain mansions. Gain all this and all that. They win everything but Christ. But the purpose of Apostle Paul says. That I may know him. That I may win who? Christ. If you win every, every other thing, if you don't win Christ, you are all men most miserable. Jesus did not come with butter and bread Christianity. He didn't come with butter and bread gospel. It is a gospel of repentance. And let's see how he did it, you know, in his time. Mark gospel. Chapter 1. Open your Bible, please. Mark gospel. Chapter 1. I read in verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. And what was the content of that preaching? What was the content of that gospel? And what should be the content of your preaching today as disciples of Christ? It's in verse 15. And saying... This is what Jesus preached. This is what Jesus said. And saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye. And believe the gospel. Jesus preached repentance. He preached repentance. And he told people to repent and to turn unto God. This is a assignment, the responsibility, the ministry that God has committed to our trust today. And we see it reverberating in every gospel. 
in every episode, in every, uh, you know, these uh, writers of uh, episodes. Let's see in Matthew chapter 28. Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 28. Reading there in verse 19. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Then he goes in verse 20, teaching them. Just like we are doing now. We preach to save souls. We teach to edify believers. To mature believers. Like we are in the teaching session now. Teaching them to observe how many things? How many things? All things. Prosperity is just one out of 1,000 things that Jesus taught. Just one thing. And many gospel preachers in our time, they make joy in the minor. They make joy in just one thing. But Jesus said, teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And the church I say, Amen. So then, the uniform command or charge in all the Gospels, and when I say Gospels now, Gospel according to St. Matthew, Gospel according to St. Mark, Gospel according to St. Luke, Gospel according to St. John, the uniform command in all the Gospel is go. We have seen it in Mark. We have seen it in Matthew. How about Luke? Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 reading there in verse 23 and the Lord said unto the servant go out you see the word again go go out into the highways and edges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled Luke chapter 10 reading there in verse 3 Luke 10, 3. Go your way. You find the word again, go. Go your way. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. So, the uniform command or charge in all the gospels is go. Every believer has to go to the neighborhood, to the streets. To the corners, to the offices, to the markets, to the schools, to the hospitals, to the prisons, to the motor parks, to railway stations, to factories, to villages, to your lecture hall, to your hostel, to the dormitory, to everywhere to preach this gospel. Anywhere you find yourself, the onus is on you to preach the gospel. Anywhere. People are found. We are to go to them and convince sinners to come to the law. Necessity is laid upon every believer to preach the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 9. I read in verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 9. Reading in verse 16. For though I preach the gospel. Here is the testimony of Apostle Paul now. For though I preach the gospel. I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Brothers and sisters, friends and invitees, it is obedience to this command of Christ that necessitated this retreat that we are holding. And as we are here in Ife region, this is uh, you know within our you know region here in Ife. So is this retreat going on simultaneously? In more than 400 locations all over Nigeria. And uh, in all other locations in Africa, you know, and beyond. I, I just returned from uh, Tanzania. And before I left that country, we, we organized, you know, this program. And uh, we combed every nook and cranny, preaching the gospel, telling them to come to the law. By the grace of God, last year, three times, I was in the United States of America doing no other thing than this preaching of the gospel. And by the grace of God, God has enabled me to get to more than 15 countries of Africa alone doing no other thing, 
preaching this gospel. And anywhere I find myself, even here, you know, in Nigeria, either in the village, in the city, in the schools, anywhere, the duty, the demand, the command is to obey, you know, this instruction. Go ye to all the world. And anywhere you find yourself, later, you know, in life, this same responsibility and assignment lies clearly on your shoulder. The campus world is an international world. And there are some of you here today who find yourself in the United States of America tomorrow, some of you in Canada, some of you in Britain, some of you, you know, in different parts of the world. You are not to abdicate this responsibility. Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel. Apostle Paul said, necessity is laid of me. He even put a woe on himself. Should he fail to carry out this assignment? We are indebted, brothers and sisters, to Christ for saving us. And this debt is payable to the entire world. Although we cannot repay him for all that he has done, we can demonstrate our gratitude by proclaiming Christ's salvation to all people, both Greeks and barbarians. That means the civilized and the uncivilized. Both the wise and the unwise. That means to the educated and the uneducated. Both to the Jews and the Gentiles. That means the religious church, the religious church goers and the unchurched people. Across all cultural, social, racial and economic lines. Read with me in Romans chapter 1 from verse 14. Romans chapter 1 reading from verse 14 through 16. Romans 1 14 to 16. I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians. The Greek and the barbarian, that is, the civilized and the uncivilized. Both to the wise and to the unwise, that is, to the educated and the uneducated, to the people in your campus, your student colleagues, and your lecturers, and the administrative staff, and the non-teaching staff, everybody, and also should you find yourself in the village, we have to preach to them as well. You don't even have to go to village before you preach to the unwise. You have the cleaners, you know, there. Those that clean your hostel. You are not to abandon them or overlook them or feel that they don't need the gospel. In fact, in the sight of God, no soul is greater than the other. The soul of a university professor is not more precious in the sight of God than the soul of, a, you know, a cleaner, a cleaner. So we are not, you know, to neglect anybody. We are to preach to everyone. In verse 15, so as much as a me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How many of you are ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Can I see your hand up there? You are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You cannot distribute tracts in the lecture room. You cannot distribute tracts in your room. Because they will make mockery of you. Because they will call you names. Old fashioned. Uh, deeper, deeper. Uh, SU. Uh, whatever. And because of that, you don't preach the gospel. Or maybe you are the Thai, you know, the fake Christian that uh, so that people will not ridicule you, make mockery of you, you know, jest at you and all that. When you are going to the church on Sunday, you take your, you know, Bible and you, you know, wrap it with nylon paper so that. Uh, People will not know where you are going. I hope there is no so, you know, spineless Christian like that among us. Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek, to the Jews. The Jews are the religious. The Jews are the religious church goers. They need the gospel. And you have many, you know, many Jews around you. Go to any campus today, and you are going to discover that uh, you know, most of our institutions in Nigeria, they are occupied and filled up with uh, you know, these Jews. When I say Jew, I don't mean people from, uh, you know, from the East. I'm talking about, I mean from the Middle East. I'm talking about religious church goers. You have many of them. 
They, those are the you know those are the uh, the Jews. Then he also talk about the Greek. The Greek are those who care less about church. The philosophers, the Epicureans, and you have them on the campus. Well, thank God, uh, the effect of the gospel is wearing, you know, uh, wearing away, you know, this, uh, you know, kind stand of the gospel, uh, you know, I mean, this kind, uh, you know, philosophy, you know, right now. Years back, when we were students on that campus, uh, you, you find, you know, very popular then, you know, this uh, doctrine and, I mean, this, uh, you know, belief that there is no God. Atheism, very strong. Among, uh, you know, university professors, especially those of them in the, you know, uh, in the humanities, they will tell you point blank, there is no God. I remember preaching to one, you know, one of my lecturers, you know, there in the 80s. And I said, hey, sir, he was an associate professor. I said, I offered him a trial and he looked at me and said, get out of my sight. You're wasting your time. There's no God anywhere. Oh, I said, oh God, but how about this, this, and that? He said, even if there is God, I will commit so much sin, I will anger God so much, I will annoy God so much, to the point that by the time he sees me on the last day, he will just hold me by the hand and will use all his energy and throw me, you know, in, as he was with all his force throwing me into hellfire, I will just land on the other side of hellfire. I looked at him, I said, you got it wrong tells you that God is that kind of uh, you know human blood and flesh that will be struggling you know, you know with you demons are there to match you down nobody will throw you they will match you down to hell if we human be uh -uh, what are we talking you appear in the law court and the judge you know maybe you are you have committed a crime and the judge the judge sentences you to, to prison to for prison will the judge rise up and then uh, you know be struggling with you to 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 send you to to the prison no the judge will just sit down there you know on his uh, ham chair rocky chair and just give a sentence and then they say court he rises up he packs his boots and just walks away the people will order you into prison. They are there. If it's like that here in the world, and you feel God will be, you know, carry, and we throw you with all this energy, and you will land at the other side of hell. Who even tells you there's other side of hell? So, we are to preach, you know, to the Greek, I mean to the Jews, as well as the Greek, with all their philosophy, with all their knowledge, with all their... Uh, Whatever thing they have put in their head, we are to preach unto them. Although not all of them will repent, but definitely, if you do it faithfully, you will not go, you know, uh, empty handed. You will have your own comforts. And I pray for you this semester, you will have a comfort for Jesus. You will have, if you will even have more than one comfort, you will have many comforts for Jesus in Jesus' name. And those of you who are in the final year, I charge you. You still have some few time left to preach on the campus. By the time you graduate and you get to the NYSC, will you have anybody at OAU there? Or anybody at the College of Mercy, you know, at uh, OAUTHC there? Or anybody at a uh, School of Nursing? Or anybody at school of uh, medical technology, uh, medical scientists, lab, lab scientists, will you have anybody you will be writing back to? Like Paul will write to Timothy and say, my son in the faith. Will you have anybody like that? I pray you will not go empty handed. I pray you will not pass through your institution without leaving a mark for Jesus. It's not enough to make academic mark. It's not enough to make first class. Thank God for making first class. God will give you first class. But more than that, you will leave a trophy at the feet of Christ in your institution in Jesus' name. By the grace of God, when I left some years ago, down in my NYC, I had people I was writing a piece to. I had people I was sending. You know, in those days, there was no answer. So, but thank God, your own generation, you are luckier. So, you will have 
people, you can take your answer and say, my daughter in the law, my son in the law. That is when your sojourn in your institution will make real meaning. I pray the Lord will help you in Jesus' name. Every believer ought to be a soul winner. To neglect it is to be stagnant and be fruitless and to eventually dehydrate spiritually. Failure to do it is tantamount to gross or flagrant disobedience to God Almighty and taking Christ's work of salvation with levity. I pray you will not be guilty of that in Jesus' name. Look at James chapter 4. Epistle general of James chapter 4. Reading there in verse 17. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, complete it for me, church. Say it out loud. Say it like you believe it. To him it is sin. I pray after being saved, you will not be guilty of sinning against uh, unbelievers, against sinners that needs the gospel message from your mouth in Jesus' name. That takes me to point number two. Church, what is point number two? I can't hear you. Compelling reasons for believers daily evangelism. Remember the word again, daily. That means it's not something that is done spasmodically. That means it is not something that is done once in a blue moon. That means it's not something that you do only when occasion deserves. No. Daily. Compelling reasons for believers daily evangelism. And there are ways you can do it daily. By the time you leave, you know, your hostel in the morning, you have some trash in your bag. And uh, as you are going to the lecture room, you meet sinners, you hand him over, hand her over, I mean, hand uh, a trash over to him or her. You are doing evangelism thereby. You are, you know, in the lecture room and the lecturer has not come and you take the advantage and you get to the front of the, uh, you know, lecture room and you say, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just before the lecturer comes, I have a word of counsel for you and within five minutes, you can pass across the gospel message. Anywhere, everywhere, it is easy to preach this gospel. I remember once, you know, I, I left my department and I was going to our fellowship center at Old Booker, Old Booker then, not religious center uh, that many of us on, uh, know now. Uh, and as I was going, I got to a uh, department of uh, dramatic arts and there was uh, a gyration that was holding at OAU then, students from you know, many campuses all over the nation, they came to do this uh, pan wine drunkard's gyration. And then as I was, you know, I was going to the fellowship, and then this uh, boy from University of Jaws just met me, you know, and they uh, said, Sir, uh, please, can you show me the way to the shrine? You know, that's the pan wine drunkard's shrine. Actually, I know the place, not that I've been there before, but it's very close to our fellowship. So anytime they are doing their gyration, you know, uh, we, normally, they, we normally hear them, you know, from uh, our own fellowship center at Old Booker. But <laughs> the thought came to my mind. Should I be the one that will direct somebody to the shrine? Within, you know, some seconds, you know, I process that in my brain. So he said, uh, the way to, to the shrine. I looked straight to him at face. I said, do you know the way to Calvary? He became more interested. He thought Calvary, he has, maybe he has never had Calvary before. He thought maybe Calvary, you know, that uh, is close by, you know, to the gyration center, the Pan White Drunkard's, uh, you know, shrine. Then uh, he said, no, he doesn't know. Oh, I said, then, listen. Then I, from there, I started telling him about how Jesus came and how he lived a godly life as a sample for us and how this Jesus Christ came as a substitute for our sin and how he suffered on the cross as uh, our propitiation and this and that and how he gave up the ghost. He died for us so that we will not die eternal death. He suffered for us so we will not suffer in eternity and all that and all that. And the only condition is for you to repent and to surrender your life to Jesus and all that. Before I spoke for five minutes, is, the boy was broken down. He started weeping. And right there and then, you know, I told him what he needed to do, uh, just believe, and this and that. Then I led him to prayer of repentance. 
He didn't know how to pray. I asked him to pray after me. I led him to confessional prayer. And after that, I prayed for him. Right there on the spot, he became gloriously comforted. Thank you for clapping. Amen. And after the confession, he didn't need to go to the shrine again. I took him to the fellowship. From our fellowship, he went back to University of Jaws, his own campus, and joined our fellowship, Deeper Life Campus Fellowship over there. So it's very easy. It's not something, you know, God is not a taskmaster. He will not demand of you what is beyond your ability. It's very simple. Everybody can, you know, can persuade a colleague. You can talk to somebody beside you. You can share your own testimony of how you came to know the Lord. By so doing, you are preaching the gospel already. Now we are looking at compelling reasons for believers daily evangelism. Number one compelling reason is because Jesus was a soul winner himself. If Christ was a soul winner and is still a soul winner, then Christians should be soul winners themselves. After all, the person who farms, what do you call him? A farmer. The one who drives, what do you call him? A driver. The one who schools, what do you call him? A student. Hey, like that. It is the one that, uh, praise the Lord, the one that follows in the full step of Christ is called what? Christian. Christ is a soul winner and Christian must also be soul winners. Look at it. Luke Gospel chapter 19. I read in verse 10. Luke chapter 19. I read here in verse 10. For the son of man of whom is that speaking church? The son of man who, who, of whom is that speaking? Eh? Jesus, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's Jesus Christ for you. That's why he came. And he did it. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Acts, chapter 10. I read there for you in verse 38. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So, that was the way Jesus went. And disciples must go that same way. Jesus was a soul winner. He see a soul winner. Because right now, he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And uh, if he did it, we are to do it. And he's even calling us to do, uh, to do the same. Look at uh, uh, John chapter 4. If you read verses 31 and 34, he says, My meat is to do the will of him who has uh, sent me. After Christ's ascension, his followers acted like him. They were busy witnessing in the markets, on the streets, in the houses, in public places, talking, reasoning, witnessing, persuading, preaching, winning souls, compelling people to believe the gospel, just like Jesus Christ himself did. If we say we are Christians, we ought also to be so many now. That's one compelling reason. Another compelling reason, because the office is great. The office is great. Look at uh, Matthew 9.37. Matthew chapter 9. Reading there in verse 37. Whosoever shall receive. Sorry, please. That's a wrong place. Matthew 9. Reading there in verse 37. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You can see there, the harvest is great. There are multitudes of unsaved souls in the world. Nigeria now, they say we are about 160 million. Out of the 160 million, I doubt 
if there are up to 3 million Christians in Nigeria. I'm not talking of church goers. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, fake believers. I'm talking of genuine Christians. Those who are saved. Those who are sanctified. Those who are spirit filled. I doubt if they are up to 3 million. That is why the effect of the gospel is, appears to be unfelt in the nation. And you see evil multiplying. And you see corruption on the increase. Sometimes I started wondering, with all this gospel effort, with all this evangelism, how is it that the country is going from bad to worse? It is because the affairs is great. The sinners are more in number than those who are to preach to them. And because the affairs is great, the few of us who are laborers cannot afford to fold our hands. We must put in our best into it. Not only that, another compelling reason, because the laborers are few. But that, uh, you know, uh, goes hand in hand, you know, with uh, the other points. The laborers are few. That's why Jesus prayed in verse, uh, you know, 38. Pray ye the Lord of the affairs. You know, he's, he, he, he sent for the prayer request. And go through the Bible. This is the only prayer request of Jesus. Jesus never prayed when he was on her. Pray for me that I will not suffer. You won't see that in the Bible. Pray for me that I will be rich. He didn't have time for that. The Bible even says, ye know, you know, the goodness of God, I mean, of the love of Christ, how that he was rich. But for our sake, he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. He didn't say, pray for me so that I will pass my exam. There's nothing wrong if you make that request. But I'm saying that this is the only prayer request that Jesus Christ gave when he was on earth. Evangelism definitely must have been the heartbeat of Jesus. That you have to request the disciples to pray to God that we send more laborers into the office. So then, we ought to evangelize. Number four compelling reason is because of the great commission. This is a great commission. When you say something is great, you must have used many standards. You must have used certain yardsticks. Before you arrive at your conclusion. When you say somebody is great. Or something is great. Maybe a person. Maybe a city. Maybe a man. Maybe a, a woman. Maybe an institution. Before you say an institution is great. You must have used certain yastis. Certain rules of measurement. Before you arrive at your conclusion. For instance you say great effect. I know there are many, you know, yassies they use before they call it great effect. Whether it's great or not, let's leave that one aside. But here is the great commission. And Jesus Christ never exaggerated. If evangelism is not a great assignment, he wouldn't have referred to it as the great commission. So because it is a great commission, and this great commission uh, to go, Ah, uh, you know, it's uh, very important. That's why we must do it. Number five, because of the unfulfilled prophecy concerning Jesus' return. You know, Jesus is coming back again. When, when Jesus comes the second time, he will not be coming to do evangelism. He will not be coming to preach, you know, to sinners, to repent. No, he will be coming to take home the elect, the saints. And then the program of God for this age will wind up. But he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. And because the gospel has not been preached in all the world, that is why the end has not come. For instance, during this my last trip yeah, to Tanzania, I, I traveled to one island called Sansibar. And on getting to that island, the whole you know, country of about, uh, about 3 million population, they were 99% Muslim. And the other so-called Christians were just Orthodox church, you know, goers, you know, and all that. And apart from that, you have the 1040 window. That's, uh, you know, these uh, uh, nations between the uh, latitude of uh, 10 degrees and, 10, uh, and 40 degrees north of equator. You're talking of countries like Libya. You're talking of countries like Tunisia. You are talking of countries like Morocco. Those places, 
you, you hardly you, you will not even find a single church there. And yet, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all nations. It is only then the hand will come. So, we are the one delay, the believers are the one delaying the second coming of Christ. If we all, you know, put in our best and we cover the whole globe, uh, immediately we'll be hastening the return of Jesus. So, because of that, we have compelling reason to preach the gospel. Not only that, because, number six now, because God will hold us accountable. Brothers and sisters, we are not guiltless. If we refuse to preach the gospel, look at it. Ezekiel chapter 3, I read in verse 17. That's in the Old Testament now. Ezekiel chapter 3, reading there in verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. You can see that God is not joking about souls of the lost. God will hold you and I accountable. God says, if you don't speak to warn the sinner, he says, they will die in their sin, but their blood will be required at your hand. I pray for you on the last day. The blood of sinners will not be required at your hand in Jesus' name. That's why we must do evangelism. That's why we must preach. Not only that, number seven reason is the word of a soul. Do you know that every soul born to this world will live forever? If they are born again, they will live forever in the presence of God in heaven. If they are not born again, if they die in their sin, they will live forever in hell. In agony. In torment. Where people put their finger in their mouth and they cry and die no forever and forever. That's why we must preach the gospel. And I'm praying that God of heaven from today will give us the tenacity, the zeal, the commission, I mean, the, the, the compassion for the lost in Jesus' name. That takes me to the last point as I round up. Commitment and crowning of faithful disciples. If we are faithful to this task, if we do it with all the zeal of our, of our youth, then there are rewards waiting for us on the last day. We read it before. Let's read Romans chapter 1 from verse 14 to 16 again. Romans chapter 1, reading there from verse 14 to 16. I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so much. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek church. I wish we make this fast our memory fast. I hope, you know, we store this, you know, fast in our heart and know that we hold the whole world, the gospel message. Can we recite it together at the count of two? Romans chapter 1, verse 16. One, two, go. I pray God will help you to pay your debt in Jesus' name. The word of a soul. The shortness of time. Brethren, time is short. Very, very short. Before you know what is happening, people have gone. This is a very month alone. I hope if you are close to the news, you will know that many important Nigerians, you know, have departed this place. I'm talking of public figures. Both in the church, church world, and then in the political arena. They've left. Last year, they were still talking. They were still doing something. But now they've gone. And I want to tell you, per second, per second, souls are dying. People are leaving this world. And where are they heading to? They are heading to an unprepared eternity. 
a place you know they never imagined that is why we must preach the gospel to them before they meet their doom and so because of the doom awaiting sinners in hellfire we should be compelled with burden and be committed to the task of soul winning as the love of christ was shown by his sacrifice for us so our love for christ is measured by the amount of sacrifice that we give for souls of men to be effective in witnessing for Christ, every soul winner requires number one, confession. We have stated that one already. We have laid the foundation at the beginning, at the introduction to the message. Every soul winner requires confession. Ye must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot. You know, Christ was so emphatic. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you cannot see the kingdom of God, how can you proclaim the kingdom of God that to which you are a stranger? So, for us to be effective, every soul winner requires confession. The blind cannot lead the blind. Or else, the two of them will fall into the ditch. So, we need confession. Not only that, to be effective in witnessing for Christ. Every soul winner, number two, requires conviction. You must have conviction. If you are not sure, if you are not persuaded, you are not going to be effective. You will just do it casually. Your approach will be spasmodic. You are not going to put, you know, your best into it because you don't have conviction. We thank God, you know, for campus people. You know, the dynamism, the zeal, the commitment is because conviction is there that this is a purpose for living. And that is what is helping us in our evangelization, you know, on the campus. We need conviction. Not only that, number three, to be effective in witnessing for Christ, every soul winner requires compassion. You must have compassion for them. If you don't have compassion for sinners, you are not going to, you know, be able to preach convincingly unto them. Jesus had compassion. So much so that when he was hungry and he sent his disciples to go and buy food, and he met that Samaritan woman by the wayside, he, you know, the appetite for food left him immediately. He started witnessing. He started preaching, you know, to that Samaritan woman. And through the Samaritan woman, other people were brought to the saving knowledge of Christ. Every, to be effective in witnessing for Christ, every soul winner requires commitment. Requires commitment. You must be committed to it. If you are not committed to it, you are not likely going to be successful in it. Show me a student who is committed to his studies. And I will show you a student that will come out with a first class. Research has even shown that the best of students are not necessarily the most intelligent. But they are the people who are the most committed. They won't miss their lecture. They will do all the assignments. They won't miss out in tutorials. They will you know, do everything. Burn the midnight oil. Little wonder they excel. The same thing, if we are committed to the work of God, definitely success will attain our mission. Not only that, consecration. Consecration is important. It is consecration that will help you to be zealous, you know, in what you are doing. Because you are committed to it, you are consecrated to it, you are yielded to it. Think about it. A general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumui, he was ministering to us. He said, I have lost desire for pleasure because of value of souls. That he doesn't even have time to rest. He gives all his life to it. In the daytime, in the night, every time, what preoccupies his mind is how sinners will be saved. And you see him at his age, preaching three times a day. What a commitment. What a consecration. If you are committed and consecrated like that, brothers and sisters will be getting souls won to Christ. I remember William Booth, when he was rounding up the training for his disciples, you know, the workers, he, he said, I wish to God that, I, that God will allow me to complete this discipleship training for you workers 
with a 24 hours hanging over hell. So that we feel the torment of hellfire. And when you now come back, nobody will teach you to go and preach. It's as serious as that. But because people don't know the seriousness, the gravity, they go about it like a dice scale. Little wonder they are not getting results. And some have been on the campus for four years, no comfort. Some have been on the campus for six years, medical student, no comfort. Some have been there five years, engineering student, no single soul that you led to the law. Will you leave the campus empty-handed? Will you empty-handed go? Not one soul with which to greet him? No, that was a concern of that man. He got comforted on the sick bed. Somebody preached to him. And he was, he didn't know anything about gospel all along his life. But now at his dying bed, somebody came and preached to him. And then he repented and gave his life to Christ. He became born again. But he knew that he was not going to come out of that sick bed. And he said, must I empty handed go? Must I meet my savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty and dead go? He said, not at death I shrink nor falter. For my Savior says me now. But to meet him empty handed. Thought of that now clouds my brow. Must I empty and dead go? I pray you will not go to the Savior empty handed. You will have confess. You have people that, you know, as fruits of your labor for Christ, that we present as your confess before him. Brothers and sisters, number one, I say confession. Number two, conviction. Number three, compassion. Number four, commitment. Number five, consecration. Number six, we need communion. Communion, prayer. Real prayer. If you are not prayerful, you are not going to be able to win so. It is not your logic. It's not your eloquence. It's not uh, in your ability to present the message that will win the heart of men. The heart of men, you know, is so, so rocky that it takes the power of God to penetrate that soul and break it down for Christ. So we need communion. Not only that, we need condescension. That's humility. The humility of Christ. We need it. We need condescension. And lastly, we need charity. Charity. You are ready to spend and be spent. Brothers and sisters, the retreat that is, uh, you know, uh, we are all you know, going through now has cost a lot of money. People have given the, uh, the non-students, you know, members of the DSCF, all of us, maybe you yourself and all that. People have laid down. If you came here two weeks ago, this place was a forest. Just like this other side too that you are seeing. But then, when I came back from my journey, and then uh, they were met with the general superintendent in Lagos, and he said, this year's Easter retreat is going to be with a difference. That uh, the campus uh, brethren, which will have their own camp separately. I started thinking in my mind, to have campus camp separately, that's going to, you know, very costly for me in my own religion, I mean, in my own region. Other places, they may not have that challenge. But here, we know the campus uh, uh, outreach is a major part of our work. And so I know it's going to you know, very, become very costly. So I came down immediately. I started scratching my brain. What do we do? And we have built all five in the adult camp, you know, uh, for the DSCF in particular. But now, if I knew that uh, they would be having a separate camp, you know, sonnet, maybe I would have deferred the construction of all five in the adult camp. But now, we can't just put them under the tree. We can't tell. Uh, just between one and a half weeks, we had this place, you know, cleared off. And we had the road constructed. And we have all these things, you know, put in place. I'm telling you, millions have gone into that. And the million came out from the, from the pockets of committed, consecrated, you know, people of God, you know, in the church. So, we need charity. If you're not ready to lay down, Definitely, you will not. We are not asking you to go and lay down a million, but you may have to lay down some amount of money to buy tracts, some amount of money to buy Christian literature and offer to people. Because when we talk about evangelism, there are different ways of approach. It's not just talking all the time. Uh, if we are a few of us seated here now, how you got converted? 
where some of us will say we got comforted in a crusade, some got comforted in the retreat, some got comforted by just reading a Christian literature that somebody offered to him or her. Some just got comforted just by reading a tract. And so, all this, uh, we must be ready to lay down, uh, to meet all that. And uh, as we do all this, definitely there is reward. God is not a taskmaster. He will not hold anybody. He's not a debtor. And if you lay down anything for him, you know, you are investing in, you know, a great uh, investment. It's a great investment. And that investment will yield great dividends. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 23 says, In all labor, there is profit. Our labor for soul is an eternal investment that yields great dividends. Whatever we invest in winning souls will be returned to us a hundredfold. Here on earth, we will conquer the following. Number one, you will conquer souls for Christ. You conquer souls. Not only that, you will conquer sins. You know, when you are preaching to others, the sins you are condemning in people, you will hardly commit it yourself. So you will conquer sin. That's why so winners usually live holy lives. I said, number one, we will conquer souls. That's comfort. Number two, we will conquer sins. We will not be sin. We will, we will live above sin. Number three, we will conquer Satan. We conquer Satan. Because you are depopulating his kingdom. You are setting at liberty all his captives. Not only that, number three, you will conquer spirits. All spirits of demon possessing individuals, you see, you conquer all those spirits and liberate them and bring them to the side of Christ. Not only that, you conquer serpents. He says, These signs I follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out demons. Uh, you know, if they, uh, you know, drink any deadly things, it will not hurt them. And many, many things, and you see that you conquer all attacks. Not only that, you conquer scorpions. Not only that, you will conquer sufferings. You conquer suffering. It becomes part and part. You are used to it now. That it doesn't move you again. Initially, when you start it, it may be a little bit difficult and all that. But as you continue doing it, you conquer all the hardship associated with it. You conquer suffering. Not only that, you conquer sorrow. Then, you conquer stumbling blocks. You know, some stumbling blocks, you say, how do I open a discussion? With this sinner and all that. But as you keep on doing it, you conquer all that. You conquer set bars. And then you conquer sickness through anointed preaching. In heaven, we will receive the following. That's our reward now that I'm showing you. Number one, we will receive commendation. Well done, faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Not only that, we will receive comfort. We will receive comfort. We will be comforted over there. Number three, we will receive consolation. Then number four, we will receive cheers. Cheers. The Bible says there is joy in heaven among the angels over one sinner that repents. And as you lead sinners to repentance, there will be cheers among the angels in heaven. And lastly, you will receive crowns. There are crowns for us in heaven for the crown of soul winners. The crown of soul winning is awaiting you in heaven. In conclusion, the heart of God is burning with compassion. So should ours be. Evils and corruption prevail all around us. The Lord is looking for men and women with burdened hearts, with bended knees, with stretched out hands, with beautiful, beautiful feet and open mouths who will go and stand and speak. To the people of all the worlds of this life, we are God's ambassador to our dying generation. Only one chance, only one hope, only one opportunity, and only one life. What will that life count for? Rise up and tell the Lord. You have only one life, and it will soon be gone. After time with you has passed away, what will your life count for? 
Is it just uh, getting degrees, certificates? If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we have all men most miserable. If all your achievement in this world is that you study one, one degree, one course, you have degrees, you have certificates, you marry, you have children, you live and you die. Like Methuselah. No trophy laid at the feet of Christ. You are not recognized in heaven. You are not known in hell. Apostle Paul said, We are all men most miserable. What's your achievement for Christ? Do you have gospel ambition? Or is it only academic ambition? Man, the God first class. Good to have first class. How about the service of the law? Are you going to lay any trophy at the feet of Christ? That man at the point of death, he got converted. But he didn't have opportunity to go and do evangelism. He didn't have opportunity to organize crusades. He didn't have opportunity to, to, to participate in koinonia. And he started lamenting right on the sick bed. And he said, not at death I shrink no water. For my Savior saves me now. But to meet my Savior empty and day. Thought of that now clouds my brow. Must I go and empty and day? Not one soul with which to greet him. Lay no trophy at his feet. Must I empty and dead go? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those that are lost. Do you have concern for the lost? Are you involved in the work of soul winning? Are you leading the sinners to the Lord? Are you making efforts? Do you give your money to soul saving venture? What's your concern? What are you going to do? It's time to arise and be involved. In the daily ministry of true disciples. Oh God. 